Hello, welcome back. Um, I'm Ashley Schaefer, and I um, am a sometimes interlocutor in these um, in these parts. Um, I just wanted to thank Charles and uh, Sergio and uh, Danielle for letting me come and play in your sandbox. Um, so, uh, and it's been a long day, and so I'm just gonna. Um, uh, reiterate quick, quickly what this panel is about, which is called Zero Sum, and these are not my words, but uh, Sergio's, um, so excuse me for reading, but rather than me trying to paraphrase a very eloquent passage, I figured I'd just uh, use his words. Um, the energy crisis and economic shocks of the 1970s led to experimental and countercultural practices of architecture and urbanism. These practices enabled the emergence of domestic applications and DIY methods of implementation in, the new, in a new political economy of solar energy. The current environmental crisis embraces zero carbon responses and has pushed the scale of operation to neoliberal corporate and governmental urbanizations. Zero Sum reviews the shifts from the domestic to the urban, from the individual to the conglomerate, political or economical, from the alternative to the new normal. Um, so our speakers, uh, first is gonna be Felipe Correa. Uh, Felipe is the uh, director of the Master of Architecture and Urban Design program here at the GSD. Uh, as both architect and urbanist, uh, Felipe Correa's design practice, Somatic Collaborative, has focused on the bridging, on bridging public and private se private sector development in large cities in the Americas and Asia. Uh, Korea is also co-founder and co-director of the South America Project. It's a kind of transcontinental applied research network that focuses on alternative physical and experimental identities within rapidly transforming geographies, uh, particularly on the South American continent, uh, pretty highly focused on uh, geographies of resource extraction. Um, today, his talk, uh, Sun from the North, will explore the work of Enrico, uh, to, I can never pronounce it, Tedeschi, Tedeschi thank you, um, uh, who designed several large-scale architectural and urban projects in Argentina, uh, so you can see the link there, that were shaped by his heliomorphological theory of design. Um, after Felipe, that will be followed by Beth Whitaker. Uh, Beth has been teaching uh, in the GSD Core Architecture Studios since 2009. Um, her Boston-based firm, Merge Architects, uh, approaches design as a partnership uh, in a process she is uh, termed uh, cross-production uh, that works between clients, fabricators, artists, uh, craftsmen, and engineers. Uh, for her, this partnership forms a kind of basis of a broader intention to define, uh, to redefine the urban and social boundaries in and around the city. Uh, Whitaker's work, which spans all scales of design from furniture to large scale institutional and multifamily housing has been published both nationally and internationally and has received multiple design awards from the uh, uh, Boston Society of Architects and the uh, uh, eight from the AIA. Uh, her talk titled Solar Driven Interventions in Formal, Formal and Formal and Surface Typologies uh, will consider the potential of familiar design elements such as Brie Soleil, balconies, roofscape and garden to transform morphologically in uh, response to various solar conditions. Um, then two other faces, well, one that's very pretty much brand new to the GSD is uh, Francesco Benedetto. Detto, who's here for her first, there you are, who's here for her first year as design critic and landscape architecture, welcome. Um, she comes to us from Milan, where she uh, founded and leads Yellow Office. Uh, it's an architectural practice with a particular focus on landscape design and urbanism. Her office and research is particularly located on the relationship between city and nature, public spaces, and geographic disciplines. Um, in its mere eight years of existence, Yellow Office has been awarded numerous international prizes and competitions. She's exhibited at uh, Venice and Chicago Biennales, and she has taught at the Politecnico di Milano University of Pisa, uh, the Nuevo Academy de Bellarte, and the Domus Academy in Milan. Um, her talk titled Amazing Sun um, uh, will look at how we might use media and research to increase kind of our cultural consciousness about how the sun operates as a kind of resource for humanity. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, Camilo Restrepo Osh Osha. Um, he's a relatively fresh face here. Uh, he's, I think he taught last year too in the design studios. He's a principal and founder of the Agen of Agenda Architecture Studio in Medellin. Um, uh, Cam Camillo, I believe, as I said, is in his second year of teaching at Option Studios. He's also on the faculty at uh, EAFIT, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that because my Spanish is terrible, uh, University in Medellin. Uh, his work kind of fluidly operates between research, practice, and exhibition. Um, he's received several national and international awards, including the Columbia Prize for Architecture. Uh, his designs, which uh, explore the potentials for incorporating social infrastructures to form a uh, kind of form of urban porosity have been widely published. Um, this afternoon, his talk titled Parasol, I believe, is going to focus on a project in development um, that evidences a kind of interest in social infrastructures uh, and a kind of deployable roof, sister, uh, roof system that generates energy and public space simultaneously. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Philippe. Well, uh, thank you, Ashley, and of course, thank you very much to Charles, uh, Sergio, and Daniel for uh, allowing me to participate in this great conference. I have to say, uh, when Charles just first approached me to uh, speak about heliomorphism, uh, in all honesty, I had no idea what heliomorphism really meant. Uh, but once I realized it's not a word in the English Oxford Dictionary, uh, that made me much more comfortable. Uh, uh, and it made me much more comfortable because it made me realize that as a keyword, it had a huge power, uh, which is to serve as a platform to trace an arch of historical and contemporary practices that have to do with the role of architecture and design at the confluence of solar orientation and spatial synthesis. It is in this context that I believe that the figure of Enrico Tedeschi makes an important contribution to heliomorphism and the conference at large. Tedeschi, an Italian-born architect, migrated to Argentina in 1948, where he developed a focused and compelling body of work across multiple settings, teaching, practice, and writing, and across multiple scales, from private residences to institutional buildings to large-scale urban plants. Through his work, the sun from the north, working in the southern hemisphere, served as an epicenter of a broader architectural synthesis. A modernist by conviction, yet less dogmatic than many of his contemporaries, Tedeschi was a deep humanist, many times compared to our very own Joseph Hudnut, who served as dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design from 1936 to 1953. Originally a member of the group around uh, uh, Metron in Milan, along with Bruno Sevi and Luigi Piccinato, Tedeschi, well, Tedeschi was also deemed as one of the pioneers of solar architecture in South America. And yes, he did design uh, and build a solar house, as so many modernist architects did in the Americas throughout the 20th century. But more importantly, he developed a body of written and built work that brought a broader humanist view to the relationship between solar orientation and architectural and urban form, a view where the implications, a view where solar implications were put at the service of a larger architectural mandate, that of mediating between society and space through the act of design. Tedeschi, a figure that has been less prominent in the historiography of architecture in Latin America, mainly because of, of his affinity to Frank Lloyd Wright in a culture where Le Corbusier was the sole master, uh, today, I think, ha presents a series of worldviews on the relationship between sun, climate, and built space that are perhaps more relevant than ever. In his most seminal text, Teoria de la Arquitectura, published in 1963, a treaty of sorts on the role of the architect and a mid-century global overview of the state of architecture, Tedeschi brings two issues to the table that are of relevance for today's conversation. The first is a call for the architect to be trained as a critical agent that, brings, uh, that can bring a, a, and construct an aesthetic project out of multiple variables. The second 
is the appearance in the theory of architecture book of a helio indicator, or a, short chart, a, a sun chart in English, as a critical component for the architectural analysis and for the design of architectural and urban form. Tedeschi dedicates a significant number of pages to sunlight and solar orientation as one of the drivers of architectural design, but also provides very rigorous analysis of the greatest hits in many ways of the uh, early and mid 20th century and analyzing them through the solar chart, giving them a very specific geographic position to a modernism that, was had, that had generally been seen as universal. What emerged out of these two concepts was not necessarily an impressionistic architecture responding to solar techni uh, technicalities, nor an early form of critical regionalism. What resulted was a series of artistic and spatial principles that were grounded in disciplinary know-how and history, in content and in context, creating an architecture that emerged from tensions between universal values and specific regional constraints, where solar concerns were not only technical, but aspirational and inspirational. A preoccupation that traversed across scales in his work from domestic space to institutional buildings to urban planning. Uh, in his own house, in the case of the uh, of uh, sort of, of that in the Tedeschi house, in the case of residential work, solar implications are utilized to argue about a new relationship between interior and exterior. Heat retaining walls and extended overhangs allow for a deep threshold between inside and outside. A direct response to Bruno Sevi, who denied architectural value to anything that did not have a clear condition of interiority and a powerful argument for the connection of architecture to a broader terrestrial and, cel and celestial contexts. Uh, and I think in this case, it's quite clear to begin to see the way that the overhang, sort of in addition to protecting uh, sort of from northern sun, also begins to create a, 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 an ambiguity between an interiorized garden or an exteriorized living room. And I think this fluid fluidity between interior and exterior is something that begins to appear and reappear in a lot of his work. The same with the continuity of certain materials that begin to blur the distinction between inside and outside. Uh, in the case uh, of the Casa Nueva de Julio, uh, an extension of the living room and dining room to the exterior through the, a, a certain amount of material continuity, but also through the introduction of a circular space that actually brings uniform light throughout the course of the day and creates an exterior space right in the center of the living room. Uh, at a larger scale, through an institutional building, in this case, the School of Architecture in Mendoza, which he founded, designed the building, and served as the dean of the school. Those were the days. Um, uh, issues of sunlight and solar orientation inform the design of a singular organizational system that is at once structure, canopy, and shading device, allowing for setbacks based on sun angle to define the frontality and depth of the building. A system that is simultaneously a part and a whole serves as an intermediate enclosed room, uh, enclosure with class, uh, classrooms and studio spaces defined by a very thin glass envelope. Solar manipulations allows for the definition of front and back, where the front of the building looking north is set back to create a forced perspective, further accentuated by the setback of the classrooms, allowing for the floor slabs to act as a shading device and also as the main circulation of the building. Along the southern, southern facade, the envelope is pushed directly against the structural mesh since there is no need for extreme solar protection. Uh, finally, at an urban and regional scale, issues of sunlight and solar orientation had a pivotal role in reimagining the city of Mendoza, uh, where Tedeschi served as director of city planning in the late 1950s. In an effort to mitigate heat in a rapidly growing city, subject to extreme changes in, in temperature throughout the course of the day, Tedeschi envisioned the integration of the region's famous water canals, better known as acequias, into the urban grid of the city. Conceiving a project uh, named the Ciudad Acequia, or the Canal City. Tedeschi argued for the careful realignment of water canals and vegetation within the city grid, 
something that would not only help drop the heat island effect drastically, but also generate a de facto public space framework for Mendoza, one that could gradually expand and improve over time. And for me, this simultaneity between sort of solar implications, the organization of public space, and the reorganization of the grid of the city begins to bring, I think, a certain synthesis that is essential in the context of looking at a, 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 at issues of, uh, of solar orientation and sunlight through design. Uh, and, and here we can begin to see that in many of these cases, right, the logic is something that sort of activated significant public spaces in the city, but it also began to define a logic for sidewalks, a system to drain the city, and a system that created sort of a presence of vegetation that even until today has a significant effect in the way that, uh, 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 that the heat island is mitigated and in the way that the city constructs a very unique logic of, uh, of public uh, and collective space. Uh, in that context, uh, I think today, as we witness a period of extreme environmental changes and challenges and a rebirth of a certain degree of technological determinism, it is very important in my opinion, to revisit figures like Enrico Tedeschi, who remind us of the essential role of architecture as a discipline who can effectively bring a critical spatial, sy spatial synthesis between technology, culture, and material through design. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, thanks everybody for coming and thank you Charles. Where are you Charles? There you are. For having me uh, and Sergio and Danielle. I had the same thought when I was invited, like really? Heliomorphism, you're inviting me? Um, so, you know, when I was starting to put this together last week, as one does, <laughs> a little bit before they have to give the talk, I started to panic um, because I thought, I don't want to show a bunch of work where I'm stretching the topic to match my projects, um, but I need to show my projects because that's what I'm here for is to talk about my work through this lens. So that's what we do. Um, but when I put this title page together yesterday, I put a question mark after solar driven um, because my I'm not solar driven in my practice and design. Um, my office isn't. However, uh, I feel very sincere about the projects I'm going to talk about today because they are, the pieces of them are solar driven. Um, and full disclosure that, you know, I've been teaching studio here for a few years and of course thermodynamics have been infiltrated into the program, which is wonderful, but I myself have had my own inner um, conflict of how to actually weave it into the way that I talk about design and think about design. So I'm doing it in my practice as well. So this is work that is struggling to get into this conversation. Um, and here's how we're doing it so far. So I think that, okay, great. So I wanted to talk really fast, and I've got my phone up here so I can check the time, uh-huh, about what are the sensibilities of, of my work, um, which has had nothing to do with solar for the first few years, and what I like. And I show this image because I like it. And I like it, I'm sorry, Scott, I like it because it's chaotic, formally. Um, and it has no rules. Um, this is a Tadashi Kawamata uh, sculpture. And it's a kind of, what can we do with this mentality? And I think um, in the early years of my practice, I had to do that quite a bit, given the scale and scope of our work and the super tight budgets um, and time frames and so on. So we've worked a lot in the past with um, off the shelf um, objects and tried to create uh, surfaces and um, uh, three dimensional and more two dimensional and also how to incorporate um, this attitude about surface and, and assembly. I would say more, often more assembly than fabrication um, depending on the project and the kind of sensibilities that have grown from that um, approach. Uh, and alongside with that, which I think this is heavy, kind of um, low-tech, high-craft is what I call it, uh, where we are trying to rethink something like a bookshelf, um, super small, uh, to things that are much larger today because um, we are growing and I'm trying to figure out how to scale up 
um, the way that I've been designing and thinking uh, about design and space. Um, and also what I call social choreography, which is not about um, any sort of noble pursuit, so to speak, but how we can engender a way people use the space, which all architects do, I get that. Um, we've obsessed in the past over things like a bench, like at Middlesex Lounge, which I'm not showing here, was one of our first projects, I think 10 years ago now. And the bench was two inches shorter than a typical seat and I think 10 inches wider, which is, sounds very uninteresting, but it actually created an incredible social space where people sit back to back that don't know each other, the bench is on wheels. And so in our own small way, I've been incredibly obsessed with how, with very modest means, we can make things happen that may not happen there otherwise. So trying to now bring that into the bigger scale work, we're starting to do a lot of um, uh, housing projects and how that might, those sensibilities, um, both the social uh, engagement as well as the kind of craft and the way we think about um, tectonics um, can carry through. So again, just a few fast images um, of what I just said and some of our early projects. Uh, and we've also been very hands-on in actually making and assembling and building some of these pieces. These are not installations. Uh, we work um, through uh, uh, real uh, programs like retail and, and um, small single family residential and restaurants in a kind of exploratory research-like manner with the materials that we use. So this project I wanted to show because this is a, I think it was 24 feet foot um, tall space. Uh, it's a clinic, a health clinic of sort <laughs> that had, was windowless. And it, we had one, I think four by six skylight, 23 or four feet up. And we had to figure out a way to bring all the light down into this um, belly in the main space of this clinic. So we uh, fabricated these CNC cut um, curved ribs and then wrapped this eighth inch poly um, panels uh, onto the surface with little rads. And it was very simple. And the effect was um, uh, 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 very impactful and very bright. Um, and then how, again, these are interiors. So I know I'm here to talk about um, more well, I'm about to get into some more exterior ground up buildings, but I wanted to show how both artificial and natural light and how it's affected the practice um, thus far. And the way we think about form, and again, the kind of DIY um, form making, this is uh, some light fixtures um, that we designed and made in the office for an MIT project. Um, and again, about fabrication and assembly. So jumping right in to the first project, which is a uh, a housing project. Um, I think this was the second housing project we ever received. Um, and it's in Boston, and it is um, in East Boston. It's right on the water. This is downtown Boston proper, and this is the south. So it, it's the, actually there isn't a building there. I need to fix that. That was a, a previous. So this is wide open to the water, and it gets blasted with southern light. Um, and what was, um, like the way that I talk about a lot of the projects is, you know, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that goes into a project that isn't about solar as there needs to be. So I'm a little suspicious about projects that are fully solar driven in terms of um, form or interior. But for today, what I'm trying to pull out, of course, of those relevant um, aspects of the project, and some were driven by this more than others, but also to think of it more as the core project within the project. This is, uh, what's great about this site it's uh, a really gritty site um, next to an uh, operational shipyard. So the architecture was, um, the context was really wonderful for us because we're abutting right up against the shipyard architecture, which is this very industrial boxy um, uh, fabric um, in big scale, um, and then flanked by these classic East Boston triple deckers, a little less inspiring, but it helped me navigate the neighborhood approval process, which is challenging, especially in Boston, where anything remotely contemporary is met with um, resistance. And so I'm constantly having to construct a narrative about how this fits in. So for this project, again, um, right on the water, and this is the site. Uh, we, again, it is, it is um, south facing. The frontage was not that big. So we are trying to, but deep, we are trying to fit in housing units that could take advantage of the light um, needed to, because I needed to put in nine. 
um, of the front as well as the back. So what we ended up coming up with was um, a series of floor through units. So all nine units have front facing um, living spaces. So a little bit about the context. So again, um, on the water, uh, the context of the shipyard and the um, aesthetic of these big buildings and then these wonderful artists that have these giant uh, steel structures that are sprinkled about. And then just trying to understand um, how to mitigate uh, the sun um, on that south facing facade. So a little bit more about the context, the triple deckers, um, and then the Typology, typology of the floor through unit, um, and this is um, looking at it from the front facade view of these nine tube spaces and units that stack. And so just very quickly, um, the balcony. So I'm obsessed um, with the balcony. I love this, even though I didn't invent it, it's not a big deal, it's not a big space, but it is this incredible interface between the private world of, of the city dweller and their unit and their apartment and the streetscape. And so because we've been working on a lot of these six unit, nine unit projects, um, the scale is very intimate and the connection and the dialogue and the opportunity for that um, at the um, street is very real, very different from a 300 unit um, building. So this, because this abuts right up against the shipyard right here, this is a little bit of a vehicular dead end, but a pedestrian pass through. So this is a um, you know, cold concrete and asphalt corner of the city that we um, were interested in also trying to find a way to green as well as shade. And so the balconies serve as this interface between, of course, the unit and the street. And so conceptually, we thought of, um, you know, how are we going to open it up to the street yet shade it from the southern, southern facing, south facing light? So we were, of course, thinking about porosity, um, the uh, tectonics of the shipyard, which is this kind of chain link fence, um, and this industrial nature. And so we came up with a way to figure each one of these tubes. And so they each have their own identity. Um, as an actual frame. Um, and the frames are very playful that sit in front of very regular window pattern for um, economical reasons, but that this is expressed, this figure is expressed um, for each one of these units with these angled um, gusset plates. So uh, what, what, this, what we used is a, not a chain link, but actually a very nice German um, uh, uh, stainless steel mesh, which is reminiscent. Um, but it allows for the porosity and it also allows for um, a growing screen. So this is a vertical garden that we have uh, nested into the corner of this um, pocket of the city. And so each balcony has, of course, the frame, the mesh, uh, and so on. And so the intent, it's, it's been up for a couple years, um, is that it will be, depending on the season, consumed around these yellow frames with green. So, this is a um, just a couple of shots of the fabrication, which I think bring us back to some of those early images of how we work with these discretized pieces. We had to literally have someone sew this on the facade. So the rest of the building was dumb. It was corrugated metal. There's something really interesting with the section, which I'm not going to get into today. So there was more to the project. But in terms of any kind of particular detailing, it was all very standard except for this facade. And so we tried to bring back in our sensibilities of the peg wall, um, of the cotton strap wall, and so on, into something much larger in scale. And so there it is, finished, imagined. And then there's that sliver of space between, of course, the balcony, between the street and the unit. Okay. So the next project um, is a, uh, a much bigger project proposal for a little less than 300 units. And what we were interested in is um, coming up with uh, a series of mixed um, unit types. So two bedroom, three bedroom, one bedroom, and so on. And then um, trying to strategize uh, the courtyard condition with regard to the sun. But again, back to the point where I don't think every project, it's not as though we wanted to configure every um, uh, parcel figure ground in terms of the solar orientation of the sun. So what we have is we are dealing with southern facades in a particular way with this one building and then proposing a kind of courtyard condition that would uh, interconnect various um, parcels of similar size. And so here is the, um, the one facade that I want to 
talk about briefly, and this is a bit of a scale up. Again, it's about the balcony, but it's at a um, slightly different take on it. We are, in this particular project, looking at a way to um, create what's called, we call it the Dot Mod Project. This is on Dorchester Ave in Boston. And we are looking for a way to pack modular units that will accommodate a kind of combined um, uh, a scenario where you can have a one bedroom that can be ganged with another one bedroom and be joined as then a two bedroom and so on and so forth. So the one bedroom units though we um, uh, designed on the south facing facade because um, there was an idea about a way of uh, creating that space, a deepening for a balcony condition that would allow for this social space of the balcony and have a deeper shadowed shaded facade for that for that purpose. So we thought the one bedroom unit actually has um, the more the social opportunities for the kind of user and the buyer for those particular units that might really take advantage of that cross connection with the balconies, which I'll better describe in a, in a image in just a moment. So again, just showing how we're um, going to stack these modular units um, and create this low to high rise um, composition. Uh, the low was on the street side and the high rise actually rose up to these um, existing train tracks that had a view of the city. And so this is um, one of the modules, this, the stack. So you can see how two of them are angled and one has more of an orthogonal um, extension. And so when you slightly shift them and stack them, um, it creates a um, triangular balcony condition, and then when they're staggered in uh, elevation, they have these diagonal relationships with each other. And so that's the view of the city, um, of the sun rather, um, blasting that, that particular facade. Um, this is the unfolded elevation. So the uh, idea is that there's a pixelation that wraps this figure, and that pixelation gets condensed and compressed and conflated and then deepened on this particular southern facade to allow for these balconies to occur. So it's the only, the only um, surface that has this triangular balcony. So this is the, uh, the flat face um, on Dorchester Ave, and then as we wrap the corner, things start to shift um, in plan, and the geometry uh, creates this kind of um, textured and deeper balcony, series of balconies. So in this image, you can see how the, the idea is that there are people on, you know, on the balconies that are actually um, diagonally and obliquely related um, uh, to the space above and below. Next project, so this one is not so much about direct due south. This is about, um, the typology is more of a courtyard house. This is a single family, um, dwelling in Lexington that we just finished a few months ago. And so we, you know, we work with what we have. So we had a bench at Middlesex, we had a balcony, um, which is a very small space um, for this social interface. And then with this house, it's just a family. So it's a family of three, but we were um, thinking about in the office, you know, how do you actually start to set up a different kind of um, uh, social situation between a bedroom and a bathroom and a kitchen and a bedroom and a bedroom and a living room and a bathroom inside of, um, in this case, a house that is less than 2,000 square feet. So it's it's not very big and the it's two stories, um, but the charge from the client was to uh, rip down this house, which is a small, modest cape, and, and, and build something new. Well, actually, he originally hired us to put in a contemporary addition on the back so that he could see his garden better. And so one thing led to another, and we ended up tearing it down and proposing um, that box. I'm not sure how to go back. Hang on. So, okay. Um, so when we were looking at uh, the idea of creating a home or even an addition in the first couple of weeks of the project to better see his garden, which he's, by the way, he spent 10 years cultivating this incredible garden with over 65 um, Japanese maple species on the property, and yet the house was very neglected. So it wasn't a hard sell to take that down and come up with something um, much richer and, uh, and that would not only allow him to see his garden, but to bring the garden into the space, um, quite literally. So what we did was, okay, we, uh, what we've done is we've actually um, proposed and now built uh, seven, one, two, three, seven 
recess gardens that um, act like um, small courtyards between the individual programmatic um, spaces in the house. So they are pockets and they're recessed out of this, um, not quite a cube, but almost a cube. And then there's one large one at the top on the second floor, these are all on the second floor, that carves in and becomes a small courtyard in the round that all the uh, ground level living space circulates around. And so for, for me, this, this project, um, isn't about necessarily direct light, although it gets it. Um, it's about an, uh, sometimes a direct light, more of an ambient light, and more of a, a, a kind of a, a ricochet or a reflectivity or a um, multiplication of these light sources because there's so many openings and recesses of different scales and sizes and so on that there's, there's reflection, there's transparency, there's direct light, there's reflective light. And so um, even on a cloudy day, the uh, the house just glows because there's, we painted it white, of course, for the most part, and there are all these pockets of sun and um, even um, and, and reflection from the outside as well as the interior. And so here you can see how it locks into the site with these recessed gardens um, and how they bring the green space, of course, into the house. Uh, first level on the, on the left, which shows the very small courtyard, which is just a, um, a hint at what's happening on the second level, which are these... Um, five additional uh, recessed gardens. And I'll, I also want to note that the, I think it's important to know that this particular space where that dashed line is, is, is a double height space. So this lower corner is um, uh, able to appreciate and understand and have um, the uh, second level, which has these recessed gardens as part of that lower level living space. So a quick section, very simple, with the courtyard recess. Of course, he put a tree in the middle. And then here's the house. So um, it, unfortunately, it's all about the garden, and we had to shoot it in the winter. Um, so it's, it's not very lush, but it will be. Um, and it is right now from the summer months. Um, but it's also wrapped in Corten steel, which of course will rust over time. Uh, but it has a very interesting relationship to the site. Um, with these pockets of space, uh, these gardens that are uh, on the second level and how they act as a kind of raised garden from without as well as this interior garden from within. And so on the interior, just a few images that I hope show how this entire space is constantly glowing, even on a cold winter cloudy day with these pockets of exterior space within. This is the single courtyard on the ground floor the living space that abuts it and wraps it from the kitchen. This is all the first, first level. And there's the double height space that incorporates the gardens above. And so it, it's, it's interesting because in a way the courtyards um, divide uh, these uh, private spaces of the bedrooms and office and so on and yet they um, connect them in a strange way because you can see through. And then quickly, um, we are also looking at very simple um, form typologies, the gable. Again, this is, uh, it's been a very difficult building, um, a lot of these projects in Boston. This is, this is a net zero neighborhood that we're proposing in West Roxbury, which is right on the Jamaica Plain line, not far um, from Brookline. And we have, um, we are uh, proposing what we're calling townhomes because they are strategically connected at the base so that they can be considered townhomes for co-compliance, but they, we actually wanted to design them as though they uh, were experienced as single family homes. So the site is oriented not strictly due south. Um, there's the north south in the bottom right corner. And what's great about that is we had to lay out this site plan almost exactly like this. We went through many, many, many site plans. And the reason is of the particular um, grade of the site, it actually slopes 40 feet from the um, front of the site to the back of the site. So there's already an orthogonal relationship to the property line um, that we had to adhere to. But what's great about it, because we're going for net zero, is we're uh, certainly gonna have a PV array on the roofs and they need to be strictly due south. So it allowed us to create these um, 
uh, figures that started out conceptually as a box and then cut them due south on the oblique. So the gables are uh, asymmetrical but allowed for a, a kind of side gable profile that we were able to talk through um, narratively with the neighborhood as a contemporary interpretation of the classic um, vernacular gable house that's prevalent in this neighborhood. So it it, it was a, it was a um, strategy of how to and I'll show you a couple of images of how we walked them through the conceptual process, which um, allowed them to kind of enter into this discussion of how it's contextual with their neighborhood. So there's the, uh, the, the site again is not due south, but the actual cuts on the roof are. And so that'll be the PV array. And then um, there were some also in addition for light and air, uh, not so much about the southern exposure, we have these um, uh, very intentional notches cut out of the um, types. We have three different types of these townhomes. So to when they're abutted, they have these different um, a variety of depths and gaps between them to allow for these social spaces between, but also to um, create this neighborhood that is uh, reads more as a series of single families versus these um, party wall condition townhomes. And there it is. So I think, and we were, we've probably met with um, the neighborhood um, and the city 15 times in the last year and a half. This is going through zoning in a week and a half, finally. Um, and they have, they have some serious issues about the hydrology of the site because it abuts a very beloved um, woods and parkland. But in terms of the architecture, it's been, um, embraced uh, by the community because of this narrative and the solar directionality that we've kind of walked them through. And then lastly, um, we were asked by a uh, city in Southeast China to look at a small urban village um, in a particular intersection of a series of buildings that they are either going to a whole degree of preservation versus completely demolish, um, and how to deal with uh, shade and um, in, the, in this particular um, intersection as well, and to uh, carve away at the existing fabric and actually create um, more opportunity for street life and a way to knit these structures together. So we looked at very simple assembly methods um, and a matrix of operations to these buildings that would allow for uh, different ways of um, responding to mitigating and harnessing um, shadow and sunlight and street life and public life on these streets by um, intervening into these existing uh, uh, structures, um, as well as coming up with a very simple uh, assembly and um, uh, component uh, system that could create canopies for pop-up programs and so on that allow for shades, uh, brisolet, um, and canopies. Uh, throughout this site that helps stitch the old and the new architecture together. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can say. Uh, <laughs> and um, I want to thank you, Charles and Sergio and Daniel, for this opportunity. Today, uh, I'll talk about a design proposal we did for a program between uh, Maxi Museum and MoMA PS1 called uh, YAP, Young Architectural Program. And the work was about outdoor spaces of uh, Maxi Museum in Rome. Uh, to give you the topics about the goals and the imaginative attitude behind this work, I prepared a video in which it's possible to understand our starting point and the narrative of our research and design. So if we can, uh, if we turn the light off, maybe. Hans is uh, wondering about the ultimate goal of our expedition. He's asking why. Alec, suppose you tell him. Well, why does man freeze to death trying to reach the North Pole? Why, why does man 
drive himself to, to suffer the steam and heat of the Amazon? Why does he stagger his mind with, with the mathematics of the sky? Once a question mark has arisen in the human brain, the answer must be found if, if it takes a hundred years, a thousand years. At first thought, it does seem impossible that there could be room for another fiction magazine in this country. The reader may well wonder, aren't there enough already? True, but this is not another fiction magazine. Amazing Stories is a new kind of fiction magazine. It is entirely new, entirely different, something that has never been done before in this country. There is the usual fiction magazine, the love story and the sex appeal type of magazine the adventure type, and so on. But a magazine of scientific fiction is a pioneer in its field in America. By scientific fiction, I mean the Jules Verne, an Edgar Allan Poe type of story. A charming romance intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision. It must be remembered that we live in an entirely new world. 200 years ago, stories of this kind were not possible. Science, through its various branches of mechanics, electricity, astronomy, etc., enters so intimately into all our lives today, and we are so much immersed in this science that we have become rather prone to take new inventions and discoveries for granted. The entire mode of living has changed with the present progress, and it's little wonder, therefore, that many fantastic situations are brought about today. It is in this situation that the new romancers find their great inspiration. Not only do these amazing tales make tremendously interesting reading, they are also always instructive. They supply knowledge that we might not otherwise obtain. Poe, Verne, Wells, Bellamy and many others have proved themselves real prophets. Prophecy made in many of their most amazing stories are being realized and have been realized. Many great science stories destined to be up on historical interest are still to be written. An amazing story magazine will be the medium through which such stories will come to you. Let me say only this. One day, someone else. It may be you, my boy. Or your sons, or your grandsons, will pick up where we left off. This I know. The spirit of man cannot be stopped. So this was uh, an excerpt by um, Hugo Gersbach, a preface of... Um, this is the list of the movies. Um, of uh, the first number of Amazing Story. And so we have structure as a story, our story on the base of this uh, historical science fiction magazine that try to mix education with the entertainment. So Amazing Sun wishes to be a story that opens up the minds of visitors to environmental themes in a new way that will envelop them in a space in which the protagonist is the star, the sun. Our intention was to talk about the energy requirements and environmental problems of our planet that need new answer and a new awareness. The idea was to um, reinterpret the feeling of visiting the sun, unapproachable to man as a planet. We decided so through the installation to explore this planet and to propose a journey towards the sun, towards everything that this mysterious star allows us like living beings in the planet Earth. This is uh, the context. We are in Rome, and it's a beautiful image from, uh, by Iwan Ban of the telescope of the Maxim. This, this, uh, so we start 
looking at the fundamentals of the knowledge of this start from the story of the sunspots and their inventors. Sunspots were examined in detail by telescope in 1600. In this period, this discovery created a lot of discussion between the religious community and scientists. The Aristotelian idea that all the celestial bodies were perfect and without blemish was followed by Catholics. That thought uh, that, that there were planets uh, that thought that were planets around the sun uh, was bring, uh, brought up by um, sci scientists. I repeat, I repeat. <laughs> scientists um, were against the thought of uh, uh, cat um, Catholics that it was not possible that over the sun there were sunspots, and so because they, they were perfect bodies, and they um, believed that uh, other planets uh, turned around the sun. Um, but these two guys, Galileo Galilei and Christoph Scheiner, um, uh, they shown that that was uh, another, the story was another that was this sunspot was present on the sun, and uh, we are talking about the two people that thought a lot about the legitimacy of the discovery. They start looking in the same period at the sun at the sunspot. Galileo in 1612, using his precise methods to redraw through telescope the sunspots into space, and he converted the empirical observation into focus evidence. And he, uh, in 1613, published Historia e Dimostrazioni delle Macchine Solari. Delle macchine solari. Uh, in 1630, Christoph Scheiner published Rosursina Sive Sol, and they both accused each other about uh, plagiarism. So what we decided to do was to, uh, for um, one time, so uh, Galileo Galilei obviously is uh, uh, more famous than uh, Scheiner, we bring uh, the son of um, uh, Shiner in our uh, in our space, in our ex exhibition. This is an uh, engrave uh, from the 1635, and uh, the drawing is uh, characterized by a frame dance with the flames and eruption. Inside the star, there are more eruptions, ribbons of fire, and smoking craters. Sorry. I can use this. Okay, now uh, before. Okay. Sun and Earth reunite. The sun arrives on Earth. The elements of which is, it is made, hydrogen and helium, are abounded and it becomes nature, the reflecting image of what is generated. The sun on the Earth becomes Earth itself. The areas exterior to the maxi occupied by a solar crust that, that finally can be crossed and explored, try in such a way to bring the scale of man to the scale of the sun. This is a zoom of, um, of the plaza, uh, of the square that, that represents the sun, and it's made with uh, this uh, uh, cocciopesto technique that it's uh, typical from um, ancient Roman technique, and it was useful for us not only to uh, look at back to the future somehow, and so to uh, reuse such a kind of material, but also um, for the kind of detail that it's possible to reach using this te technique that is made by hand and uh, has a lot of uh, um, possibility for color use uh, and, and so that was a, an important and ex expensive part of the proposal, but um, uh, in, in this uh, in, in this uh, square there is no, not only this um, original uh, and uh, precious uh, material, but also it's a water square with uh, um, some uh, geyser and uh, some little pools that you can create really using uh, this mosaic technique. And the idea was to um, to recreate this sort of uh, uh, solar landscape and so 
to, to talk about the magma movement uh, and so on. To crown the sun, there will be a floating uh, sitting structure made of net, numerous canvas deck chairs, uh, and light structure shaped like uh, airplanes, uh, airship, and so on. We have, I have some uh, view that somehow describe which kind of a scenario we imagined for it. And uh, also through the drawing, the idea was to uh, uh, try to uh, talk about the life and so the experience of the man that for the first time uh, is able to ex go in the sun and ex explore the sun. This was uh, the, the section of the, uh, the intervention and uh, a view from above. And uh, also ev everything was uh, linked to this uh, experience. So we had the three paths. The main path in terracotta bricks uh, allow um, the, an, an, an easy access to the larger sun square. Um, the secondary paths were made like uh, the Tibetan um, bridge and with a different degree of uh, difficulty to feel, to feel also the detachment from the ground. And these were uh, the shadowing system with the shape of airplanes uh, and uh, primitive uh, um, vehicle to explore the sky. These are uh, some clearings and the geyser area and uh, uh, the, the bench made with net to, to stay somehow not, uh, not close to the ground. And uh, um, this, uh, this solar system were, uh, was, um, uh, with, uh, was inserted in a big uh, golden uh, garden using herbaceous species in which uh, you can go inside and find uh, some shadow uh, or um, also new experience in the in the density of the, of the, of the grass. This is uh, uh, the maquette we did, and the idea was the sun is so powerful that everything became uh, golden. And that was the idea, and so we do also all uh, the, the building. And uh, this is... Um, we decided at a certain point one, one of, uh, of the most important things of the project was the, the soundtrack because you have to describe this exploration. So we, uh, we said, okay, so we can search to explore really the sun in, uh, in some place in which uh, we want to go to do a journey and uh, an holiday together. And so uh, we went to this uh, the biggest uh, uh, salt uh, area in the uh, Sahara Desert is uh, in uh, Tunisia. And uh, uh, this is a really um, an enormous uh, lake. The name is uh, Shot, uh, Scott El Gerid. And it's also set of uh, uh, a lot of sequences of Star Wars. And uh, uh, it's famous because uh, you uh, can have uh, Fata Morganas, uh, that are mirages, because uh, it, during the day it's so um, uh, hot, the warm, the climate, uh, uh, it uh, reaches the 50 uh, grades uh, Celsius. And so, and for the um, vapor, for the air and, and salt, uh, you really can see something. And that time we saw a bus in the middle of the lake. And, uh, and so and we started to walking on the sun to did the last of all these uh, things that was to do, to create this soundtrack. And, uh, and we um, did this collage with our walking on the Salt Lake, um, collage of about music linked to the exploration of the universe, of the moon, uh, and so on. And we, we, um, we try to create the, 
soundtrack of uh, a public space uh, using uh, also the imagination and uh, our experience. And this is uh, like 30 seconds of the vinyl. Okay, and this is finished. Uh, if I can say just uh, a conclusion. Uh, that maybe it's not exactly uh, at the scale, does not reflect the scale of what you saw, is that that maybe uh, what concern uh, eliomorphism could also not be just focused on buildings, but maybe on infrastructure, because uh, if we have to create a, this is uh, just a, uh, uh, brief thought, but if we have to create a big machine that uh, are able to produce energy to um, to make us free somehow from political, economical points of view, maybe the infrastructure are more, uh, or the big scale could be a possibility. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sergio, Charles, and Danny for the invitation. The, um, the title is uh, Parasol Roof Against Walls. I think it's uh, important to take into account that I'm gonna speak coming from the tropic. So Colombia, it's uh, located in the, south and in the center of Latin America, articulating the north with the south. That means that the sun there has somehow no meaning in the sense that we don't need to heat our rooms with the light or the sun of the south or the north. The temperature is pretty much the same all year round, 23 to 25 degrees Celsius all year round. And according to Alexander von Humboldt, uh, which is a very beautiful drawing, and also to say that this description of the thermal floors is what provides us the temperature. So by being tropical and uh, being Andean at the same time, this temperature is given of how high you are above sea level or up in the mountains. So all these descriptions have been taking place for many years now, since uh, Humboldt or Edwin Church, where the sun, we need to speak about how we understand the sun. The sun has a very different meaning according to the location where we are. Where we are. It's not the same sun even though we, we see it. In the case of Latin America, it's been described as this atmosphere that it's created by the mixture of humidity, atmosphere, sun, uh, temperature, and some other uh, facts. <clears throat> it's, it's been, yeah, it's, it, it's this kind of image that repeats itself and it's become a kind of a description of this ungraspable atmosphere that it's mainly a sensation out of, um, that, that, that the body per perceives and feels. The question also is how we describe this today, and I think the work of Camilo Chavarria, uh, an artist from Medellin as well, it's able to put together, which is these pictures that come together made of many other pictures and create new landscapes that are able to describe this strength of the sun. If, the sun, if you're at a sea level, the sun is very bright, it's very, very hot, and humidity plays a big role. If you are in the mountains, perhaps, then it's completely the opposite. The sun, it's still bright, but it's, it's not enough to, to give a, a temperature to a room. So we live in this ambiguity of uh, these two conditions of how we understand the tropic. Everybody believes that the tropic, it's this, uh, a beach, it's a place that it's in the sun, that it's uh, completely white sands. But also we forget that the tropic, it's also the Andean condition of being up in the mountains with completely opposite conditions, different temperatures, different atmospheres, and architecture needs to respond to these conditions. 
So somehow this is also our reality. It's uh, very exuberant. Nature becomes and plays a very big role, not only as a material, but also as an element to do this interface between what it's built and unbuilt. So in that sense, we learned that uh, 10 years ago with the competition we won in association with Paul Restrepo and, um, and Plan B Architects, uh, which is a roof for the Botanic Garden, where we were mainly asked to do a place to exhibit flowers, but we understood that it was more, more important, it was just to do a roof and let just the air go through because the sun somehow, it's a, a source of, um, of uncomfortability, let's say. So we were mainly doing something, an operation that will provide shade. So this is somehow pretty much what happened. It's a, a very simple structure. Uh, the budget here was $1 million for 3,500 square meters. Uh, this is a small video that helped me, that will help me describe the project. So it's a very simple structure that it's based on different modules. Each model has the ability to be reproduced and begin to create a field for different conditions to happen, each one with a garden. The walls are not necessary because what we are trying to do is to create a shade more than anything else. Let the architecture breathe, let the air go through and produce this kind of effect of as being into a forest. So we learned that 10 years ago, and at the beginning of this year, we were invited to do a competition for a structure that will provide a parking spot, but at the same time will produce solar energy, uh, will use, uh, will produce solar energy with solar panels. So what we did <clears throat> was to understand that a public space is a vacant, a vacant space that as, at a certain moment of the day, it's available and not only needs to have cars, but perhaps it can also become a public space. We won the competition. And we wanted to create this same feeling of the forest, this in-between space, this space that it's not inside, it's not outside, it's very undefined, it's ambiguous, it's porous, it lets the light in, but at the same time provides some shade. So it creates this architecture that has nothing to do with isolation, nothing to do with thickness. It's mainly this roof, this possibility of having a shaded surface that reacts differently according to the social conditions or the geography. So we were thinking exactly about this image, like how, oh, sorry like how this uh, superstructure, natural superstructure, it's able to provide a shade and very freestanding and autonomous structure. So <clears throat> taking into account that the word for Spanish between, for th there are two words in Spanish for a kind of an umbrella. One, it's called parasol, which is precisely to, to have a, a small uh, shade coming from the sun, but the other one, it's som uh, sombrilla. Sombrilla, it's, sorry, sombrilla is the little shade, and the other one, it's paraguas which is the one that protects from the rain. But it's the same figure, but the word means two different things. So we were making use of that um, ambiguity at the same time regarding the figure. So we thought that why not, let's think about it inverted. So we created this structure that, it's, um, that holds many different conditions for parking spots, around eight parking spots per, per unit. It can be multiplied or divided or uh, established according to the size of the plot of the land. So it takes eight cars. It has a length from one side to side, from one side to the other one of 12, almost 12 meters. The budget for this is $7,000. Um, we are about to match the budget. We are still $1,500 away from the budget. It's been very complicated because it's been how to produce a very single, simple structure that stands alone. Now the column that we are de developing, it's a ultra high performance concrete and all the troughs, it's built on site by, uh, made of steel. So it has all these um, solar panels on top that it can operate like a kind of a field of mushrooms. And then we are also trying to have all the water collected on top, bring it down also for gardening, uh, some gardens that will happen around. The idea is to plant uh, as many as possible around the country that at a certain moment will perform as a parking spot, but some days, for example, weekends or, or, or holidays, or, or you can also distribute the space as you want, will perform as a public space that performs really similar to the orchid house that we just saw. So it's very simple. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a metallic structure, as I was mentioning. These troughs are attached to a co single concrete column made of UHPC. Then it will be covered with uh, taking into account very different ways of weaving a very simple material that will be a, a synthetic rope. Also like this, using these techniques, 
and it will be something very similar to this. Just a very simple cover, way of covering below, like having a ceiling, producing solar energy, and being able to mutate for, for different conditions, from moving from a, from a parking spot to a public space. Thank you very much. So, um, just a couple of comments on that panel. I really appreciated it being the uh, last one of the day uh, and a nice transition, I think, into our next speaker because it really talked. Did I just do something? No, I'm oh, sorry. Because um, I think it really talks to this um, notion of uh, heliomorphism's potential to uh, exist between a kind of determinism and speculation. And I think these last projects were much more on the kind of speculative piece of that. Um, you know, uh, uh, Tedeschi, uh, as, as interested in despite all those kind of beautiful solar diagrams, you know, really very interested in the kind of artistic and spatial concerns. Um, I think uh, Beth's uh, kind of really both performative skins, but also these playful balconies uh, that I really appreciate. Um, uh, the, uh, the amazing uh, uh, sun project, just uh, reminding us of that kind of cultural notion of what the sun is for us and and the last project as well um, uh, you know definitely the the sun is reminding us that the the sun is different in different cultures you know we've been talking all about the kind of southern facades and it and reminding us that it's it's not always that way 